Okay, so how is everyone today? Good, I hope. Okay. So, uh, just some announcements about logistical matters. So there wasn't a lecture two days ago, okay, because of the issue on campus. Uh, there will not be a lecture next Tuesday either. Why not? is the 4th of July. So the university, in fact, is going to be closed. What, what that means in practice is, is not that any of the doors are going to be closed. It just means <laughs> that no one, no faculty, teaching faculty, is going to be here. And so, so as far as I can tell, you're free to come into this room, but I won't be here. There's nothing, there was nothing assigned two days ago which means that, that is to say, on Tuesday, which means that there's nothing due on Tuesday either. So there's nothing to turn in, and, and we didn't miss anything. Okay, so then it, what I'm trying to tell you is that you're still going to turn stuff in on Thursday, and it's going to be over today. And you didn't miss anything on Tuesday. So, so that's kind of nice, I guess. Uh, one thing is that... Two weeks from now, that is to say, not, not next week, but next, next week, next, next week, seven and eight. What? July 11th. Yeah, wh whatever it happens to be. Next, next week, there were two quizzes planned, but now one of them is canceled, okay, because Tuesday was lecture number, I have no idea. I guess lecture number eight, or no, lecture number nine or something like that. And it was going to correspond to quiz number nine. I'm not sure if that's right. But now that's, now that's done. It's not going to happen anymore. Which is to say that, I mean, I'll, I'll, call, I'll call the testing center and cancel that quiz. But at any rate, we're just going to skip it. So we're not, the, the quizzes are not going to be numbered sequentially anymore, there's going to be a gap. Quiz 9 never <coughs> happened, or whatever. So any question about any of that? Any question about any of those things? Yeah? In two weeks from now, we only sign up for quiz 9. Well, there will only be one to sign up for because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cancel it at the testing center. But I don't want you to panic because you're accustomed to signing up for one quiz, or t sorry, two quizzes, and there's only one, and then for you to be worried. Okay, now, as another weird item, is that Tuesday, that is, to, that is to say five days from now or whatever, is a planned absence. It's the 4th of July. So two weeks from next week, there will also be just one quiz. So that means for two weeks in a row, we're going to have one quiz per week. Because for two weeks in a row, we only had one <coughs> lecture on Thursday. So when, so when we get back to two quizzes, don't, you know, don't be surprised. So any question about any of that? Okay. So just to review of last time, what we were talking about. Last time we were talking about money flows. Okay, so given a money flow, f of t on the interval zero to big T and continuously compounding continuously compounding interest rate R
we came up with three scenarios and one formula for each scenario. So I'm going to write those three scenarios and I'm going to split this page into thirds. So if you're going to try and make your page look like my page, then I'm going to split it into thirds. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and do that now because I'm going to do the middle one first. So I'm going to do that middle first. So there's a scenario where we have a money flow. Hydraulic analogies work really well. And by hydraulic analogies, I mean, suppose we literally have a tube, a hose, out of which money is flowing, just like water. So suppose we've got our money hose. And money is flowing out of it. Got little monies coming out. Well, it would be it would be excellent if we could, you know, capture them. So suppose that we say, oh, we just we want to capture it. Uh, let's capture it all, all of it, into uh, a, a bucket, a bin, a swimming pool. <laughs> So it's all coming out here. All the money's coming out. Okay, and this, this flow, this money hose, has the property that at certain, you know, because it's on the interval 0 to t, maybe that's like 0 to 10 years. And money is flowing out at sometimes faster, at other times slower. So, you know, maybe, maybe years 6 through eight were really excellent and the money flow rate was high. And maybe the other years were less excellent and they were lower. Okay, furthermore, furthermore, if the flow rate is negative, what does that mean? Yeah, it's like money is, is going back into the hose, coming out of the bucket. Okay. Um, so that's the hydraulic analogy, just like, just like water. So suppose we wanted to answer the question, okay, we've got this hose, money's coming out, we're collecting it. What's the total amount of money that we'll collect in, in, for, for the duration of the, of the time interval, for the duration of the experiment? That was the first question that we addressed. And that was the easiest one to address. <laughs> that was just an integral. So the total money flow well that's the integral from 0 to big T of f of t dt. Notably that formula does not include the interest rate r. So this formula and this first and simplest thought experiment um, makes no mention of interest rate. Okay, it is just like, it'd be just like if you somehow had a magical hose in your backyard and money's coming out of it and you just dug a hole and you just directed the hose into that hole and you're just watching it. It'd be terrific. Okay, so any question about this thought experiment? Okay, then, then we said, okay, uh, Either, either from what we reviewed, because we reviewed interest rates and, and, and things like that, or from your uh, experience in your business classes, uh, because I know many of you are business and, fini and finance majors, you've almost surely heard of the phrase, the time value of money, which is to say, and the way I, the way I brought that point up is I said, would you rather have $80 right now, or would you rather have $100, or uh, 95, I think I said, $95 uh, one year in the future? Okay, and then we said, and, and furthermore, you're not going to spend this money, you're just going to hold it. So you're either going to have your 80 now and hold it, 
or you're going to have hold nothing and then have your 95 in one year. And the question, the answer to the question of whether or not it's preferable to have the 80 now or the 95 later in the end comes down to the interest rate. Comes down to the interest rate. If you have, say, a 100% interest rate, 100% interest rate, uh, and it, you know, it was compounded exactly once, just for simplicity, then that means that at the end of one year, if you deposited that 80, at the end of one year, you'd have 160. So it would be preferable to have the 80. Because in one year, that'd be more than 100. If uh, instead the interest rate was lower, if it was really low, like 1% or something like that, and it was just compounded once, then you'd have, what, $80 and 80 cents or something like that, I think. Then it would be preferable to have the 95. So what I want you to see from that experiment is that when, when, there's, when there's money and there's interest concerned, moving money forward in time through the lens of interest causes its value to increase. Okay, just like putting money into a savings account, the, the, the balance goes up as time increases. But at the same time, when you move money backwards through time, when money moves backwards through time through the lens of interest, its value decreases. So you could, you could imagine in, in your mind's eye, yourself one year from now holding a hundred dollars if you if you transported yourself through time and you could watch that procedure go then for every, all the time moving back backwards that that hundred dollars would be decreasing in value all the time you go back okay so like a hundred dollars one year from now might I don't know off the top of my head be worth something like ninety six dollars right now is how much it would be worth right now. Okay, and then if you were to transport it back a century, I have no idea, but it might be worth like 30 cents or something like that. Okay, but we could calculate it. So moving fo money forward and backward through time, so when the experiment starts, that's called the present. So, so what you're looking for is something called the present value of money. Or if you want to know what it will be at some time in the future, that's called the future value. Okay, so is everybody okay with that? Money changes value through time when, it's, when it is subject to interest. So the next question from the total money flow is, well, what would happen if we took, if we took this hose, which is still spewing out money just the same as it was before, and if this is the, this is the bin, this is the bin at time t, and it's moving forward through time. So like one year, three years, seven years. What if, what if instead of directing the money into there, so here's all the monies coming out. They're still coming out. Suppose that in that bin, right, up, right before it gets there, we put the red portal here. put a red portal here, and, and that causes the, the money to transport backwards in time, and then come out in the blue portal. And this blue portal, under the blue portal, we put a bin at the present. So this is time zero. So we're transporting all the bits of money as they come out, because the money comes out at different times, right? Money, some of the money came out at the very first instant we started. Some of the money came out at three years. Some of the money came out at, at uh, nine and a half years. Some of the money came out in the very last instant. We're gonna transport all of that money through time backwards to the beginning. So it comes out, it, it, it falls into this portal, comes out, and it ends up coming out right here 
and all the monies are now collecting here. But in doing that, they move backwards in time. Okay, and therefore, the amount of money that's in here, this bin versus that bin, what's the relationship between these two? As far as size, which one is more? Between these two. This, the bottom one is worth more. That is to say, if, if these were the same hose and same flow, if you just collected all of the money and you looked at how much money you had at the end of the experiment, that'd be more money than this thing where you put the time portal in front of it and you transport things back in time to the beginning. That's because when you're moving money backwards through time, its value decreases through the lens of, of interest. So there's less money here than here. Now, is that, because we, is that because somehow we lost money? No, it's because the money's moving backwards through time. It's the same thing as saying that if you were to put $96 in your bank account right now, in one year, it'd be 100 Because when time increases, the balance increases. So in order to, uh, what that thought experiment is, the way you handle it, it is called the present value of money. In, in, in particular, because it's a money flow, it's called the present value of the money flow. So now we want a formula that does that. So this formula was really simple. It required no consideration of interest. This one is slightly more complicated. It requires a consideration of interest. The formula is still an integral because we're accumulating all the little bits. But now we have to account for the fact that we're transporting money backwards through time. And the way that you account for it is like this. Exponential negative r t times f of little t d little t. So what this is what this factor is, you know, to, to put it in, in the, to say it conceptually, this is the factor that transports money backwards in time. Okay, that's why, that's why you have a negative symbol right there. It's exponential of negative RT because it's moving in the negative time direction. It's moving backwards. Okay, so then we did a few, we, we did some examples of, of using this formula. Okay, there was one other thought experiment that we went through, and what was that? <coughs> the future value of money. The future value of money. Okay, now the thought experiment is, is that we've got the same money hose. Still the money is pouring out of the hose. So here comes the monies, they're coming out. And then originally we had designed them to be collected in the little t bin. So for any value of t, that is to say at, uh, at time is, uh, I'm going to draw that just a little bit lower. At the time is the first instant, one year, seven years, anywhere. That's where it collects the money. And no reckoning of interest. And then... The, the present value of money experiment was, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to put the red portal in front of it. The money falls into the red portal and gets tran transported backwards in time into the blue portal. So, so far I'm just drawing the present value.
Okay, but then to get the future value, to get the future value, we do this again, right? <laughs> so now the money is, it has been transported backwards in time to the present value, but now we're going to transport it forwards in time to the end of the, to the, end of the experiment. So that is to say, there's another red portal right here. So it, it, the money was going to fall out and accumulate right here in the present, but now we're going to actually make it accumulate at the end of the experiment. At little t is at time is big T. So now. We transport the money forward in time. And so here's all the little monies coming out, and they accumulate over here. So now, of, of these three thought experiments, numerically, how are they ordered? Which one has the least money, which one has the most money, and which one has the intermediate amount of money? Okay, but... Okay. What I mean is, is that if you, when you calculate this integral versus this integral versus the one that I haven't written, which one is the smallest value, which one is the medium value, and which one is the largest? And why? Okay. But this one doesn't have any interest in it either. Okay. So let, let's write down, so what's, what's the name of this one, by the way? Future value of the money flow. Now that's not the phrase that your book uses. I'm not, I'm not sure why they don't. Rather, instead of saying the future value of the money flow, what your book calls it is the accumulated amount accumulated <clears throat> amount of the money flow accumulated as a d and the formula is so it starts out just like the present value because look at the machine the machine takes the money redirects it backwards in time through the lens of interest to the present. So the formula starts out looking just like the present value formula. So exponential negative r little t times f of t dt. But then it gets followed up by transporting the time to the future. So because, because we're going to transport the time to the future, that's the positive time direction. That means it's going to be not, not exponential negative something, but exponential positive something. So it's exponential positive r. And how far into the future are we going? To the end, right? So this is big T. So what this, what this is saying, this is, this is you taking the money backwards in time to the present. That's what this fact, exponential factor is saying. This one is saying that you're moving, the forward, you're moving the money forward in time to the end. That's why it's positive. They both have r because both of these trajectories are r uh, through the same interest rate. Okay. So now, these are in, in increasing order going down, which is to say, this is the smallest one, this is the medium one, and this is the biggest one. 
Okay, the, the reason is because this it just is what it is. This is what it is. This is, um, you're just, you just put a bucket under the money hose so that you wouldn't lose any of it. And you have no conception of interest rate. This is you're taking all of the money and instead of putting a bucket under it, you put a portal under it and the portal transports it back in time. But when you transport money backwards in time, its value decreases when you go backwards. That's why this integral will be less than that one. Okay, then, now, <laughs> for this one, you, do, you still start out by transporting the money backwards, but then you transport it all the way forward in time. That's the reason why this one is the most. Conceptually, conceptually, doing this strange device where you transport it backwards and then forwards in time, that's the same as saying, well, I'm not going to put the hose into a swimming pool, and I'm not going to transport the money backwards in time. Rather, I'm just going to connect the hose to the bank that, that has an interest-bearing account. So this is the best financially option. Good. So any question about, about this? Beautiful. Okay. <clears throat> so now the next thing. <clears throat> so now we're in section 8.4, which is called improper mm -hmm. integrals. This, it's always fun to introduce a math topic, which is the same as the previous topic, except has a new adjective, right? So we've talked about integrals, but now we're talking about improper integrals, <laughs> which is funny because that sort of raises the question, does, does that mean that there's a, a proper integral? If, there, if they can, evidently they can be improper, because of the title, so I guess they could be proper. May, can they be read? I don't know. I haven't thought about it. So let's see. In order to understand this topic, it's a, it, it is a little bit abstract. So um, we need to make a couple considerations before I describe exactly what it means for an integral to be improper. So in the first place, Here is an integral that is not surprising. So there's an integral. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you could use the fundamental theorem and you could calculate its value exactly. <coughs> I have a question for you. Does the value that you compute depend on x? Does it depend on x? Well, let's think about it. Let's just go ahead and do it. Right? So we could use the fundamental theorem, which is to, which is to say you should, be, you should be able to tell me the antiderivative of 2x. So what's the antiderivative of 2x? x squared. So the fundamental theorem is saying that the answer should be x squared evaluated from 1 to 3. Well, that's uh, 9 minus 1, which is 8. So does it depend, does the, an so the answer is 8. Does the answer depend on x? No, right? It's 8. <laughs> what is the value of 8 when x is equal to 10? 8. What is the value of 8 when it's sunny outside? 8. <laughs> what about when, it's, uh, when, when there's really bad weather like tornadoes? Uh, its value is 8, right? That's one of the most outstanding things about 8. Okay, then what about, what about this one then? Uh, the integral 
from 1 to 3 of 2w dw. What would that be? It also would be 8. Right? D d will the answer depend on w? It cannot. The answer is 8. Okay, what about, what about uh, the integral from 1 to 3 of 2 smiley face d smiley face? Same thing, right? It can't possibly depend on that symbol. It's 8. It cannot depend on that symbol. So as everyone see, it makes no difference what symbol you use. It could be an X, it could be a Y, a W, a smiley face, whatever you like. Does not depend on that symbol. Okay. Uh, two. How about the integral from 1 to b of 2x dx? So, my first question. Does the answer depend on x? No, it can't, right? We just got finished saying that. Let, let's figure out what the answer is. So, it would be x squared evaluated from 1 to b. So then, what's the simplest possible way to write the answer? B squared minus 1. So the answer is b squared minus 1. OK. What is the integral from 1 to b of 2 square d squared? Same thing, right? B squared minus 1. Do you observe that this symbol right here, x, and its counterpart, dx, I could replace that with any, any old thing that I wanted, right? I could, I could, I, I used a square, I used a smiley face, um, I could, I could use letters from other alphabets entirely, 2 mu d mu, mu is a Greek letter equivalent to our M phonetically, the answer is B squared minus 1. So, now, as for these integrals, do these integrals depend on the value of B? They do, right? Because, say, if B was 10, the answer would be 99. But if, if B were, uh, say, 20, then the answer would be 399. So it depends on the value of b. So what I want you to see from this is as a result of these considerations. Therefore, the integral from a to b of anything, of any old function, I'm writing, I'm writing 2x dx just because I wrote it any, anywhere, but I want you to understand that it's any old function. This, the value of this, The value of this integral does not depend on x. It doesn't depend on that. That's what I was saying up here. It doesn't matter what name you choose for x. So for those of you that just like to know the name of that thing, it's called the index. So the value of an integral does not depend on its index symbol, which is to say here the index was x and the answer was 8. Here the index is w, it's still 8 the answer. Here the index is smiley face, still 8. 
So the, so the integral, the value of the integral cannot depend on the index. But the, the, but it, the value of the integral does depend on these, A and B. And what are those called? The limits. So when you're computing an integral, if the index symbol is x, the answer cannot depend on x. Okay? And if the index, if the limit symbols are a and b, the answer can depend on a and b. Okay. So any question about this interesting observation? Okay. Second. So a brief review of limits at infinity. So this is a calculus one topic, but I want to make sure that you remember all those fond times. <coughs> so first, the limit as x goes to infinity of x to n, where n is positive, is equal to what? So an example <coughs> would be something like the limit as x goes to infinity of x squared like so. So what's the limit as x goes to infinity of x squared? Infinite, right? Because what you're asking is you're saying, well, consider the expression x squared. If you start plugging in larger and larger values of x, x is getting bigger and x squared is getting even bigger, right? So the value of this limit is infinite. Okay, so what's this one? Infinite, right? Okay, how about this one? The limit as x goes to infinity of x to negative n when n is positive is something. So such an example, an example of this, would be something like the limit as x goes to infinity of x to negative 3. Well, what's this? Not negative infinity. So, let me give you a big hint. So when you're doing calculus, it's very often nice to use negative exponents. But when you're doing algebra, very often it's nice not to use negative exponents. How could we express x to negative 3 but without any negative exponents? 1 over x cubed. So now let's imagine here for a moment. So x is going to infinity. What is x cubed doing? Not 1 over x cubed, just x cubed. What's it doing? It's getting big. It's getting really big. So what, I'm, what we're saying is that the denominator is becoming mm -hmm. infinite. 
So how about one over that? It's getting smaller, right? So what's the limit? No, it's zero. So let's think about why it, it should be zero for a moment. So suppose you've got a pizza, a, a good one, real good pizza, and you've just, it's just you and your buddy, and you cut, and, and therefore you cut the pizza into two pieces, equal pieces, and everybody gets a real good piece, right? <laughs> Can you imagine trying to eat half a pizza, right? Okay, so suppose it's you and your seven friends, so that there's eight of you. Okay, well, you can still cut the pizza into eight pieces, and everybody gets more or less a, a fair piece. But do you, do you observe it's less, than, it's less than when there were just two people? Okay, now suppose that instead of there being eight people, suppose that there's eight million people. Well, in principle, you could, in fact, cut a pizza into eight million equally sized pieces. In, it is, in principle, possible. But supposing you were to do that, no one would get very much, right? It's the same thing here. Is you're cutting one thing into increasingly larger pieces, uh, increasingly larger num n number of pieces. So, how much pizza do you get if there's infinitely many people? None, right? That's how much you get. Okay. So, what's the answer for this one? Zero. Okay. Three. The limit as x goes to infinity of the exponential of x. What will this be? <coughs> what do you think? It does. It's infinite. It's infinite because, well, this is, frankly speaking, one of the plots that you just must memorize. It's one of the things that you're expected to know. So when you plot y is e to x, then th that is the exponential growth model with the, with the natural base. So it's like this. And it's, it's going up real quick, right? real, real quick. So like e to, you know, e to 10 is already a very big number. It's an enormous number. E, e to 100 is now starting to be a number that's hard to conceive just how big that number is, e to 100. e to 200, if you go out here to 200, the, the value of the exponential of 200 is more than the number of atoms in the known universe. It's a lot, okay? It's an enormous number. Okay, so, so, infinite. Okay, what about, what about its counterpart, the limit as x goes to infinity of the exponential of negative x? What? Zero. It will be zero, and there's a lot of reasons why. One, one sort of easy reason you can observe why is that the only difference between, between these two is that I negated the x. And what visually does negating the x do to the plot? So you can see algebraically, I changed it from x to negative x. That's the algebraic change. Then there's a corresponding geometric change, a visual change. How, what is the visual change? It 
flips the red over. It flips it horizontally across the vertical axis. So now, now it looks like this. So that decays to zero. That's, the, that's exponential decay. So this is exponential growth, which is unbounded, and this is exponential decay, which is to zero. So any question about these two? Okay. Alternatively, if, if you're, since I'm getting a few furled brows <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the crowd here, uh, I'll say, well, how about if we say that this is the limit as x goes to infinity, and how can we express this without any negative exponents? 1 over e to x. So then now the exact same story we said before. e to x, the denominator is getting very big, very fast. So 1 over it is getting small. So you get 0. OK, last one that we need to know, at least for the purposes of this <coughs> section, is the limit as x goes to infinity of the natural log of x. What is this one? sort of raises the question, well, just what does the natural log of x look like? How do you get it? So now we go all the way back to college algebra. So here I'm going to draw a copy of the exponential function. So I'm just going to copy this one except bigger. So this is y is e to x. So do you remember something from college algebra? Something about whether or not a function has a, is called one to one. So do you remember that phrase, one to one? One to one. Depending on your instructor, they might have said, if your instructor was me, <laughs> then, I, then I said, not one to one, but I said injective which is a different name for the same thing. So any, any rem remembrance of this phrase? How about, how about the horizontal line test? Do you remember this thing? Now, now more bells are ringing. So the horizontal line test is, in the end, you're checking how many times does a, hor does a horizontal line cross the plot? Okay, and it's the, 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 the function, the plot, is said to pass the horizontal line test if every horizontal line crosses zero or one times. So how about in this case? Does every horizontal line cross the red zero or one times? Yeah, because you can see down here, there's zero crossings. So that, that's, a, that's a legitimate number of crossings. And then that, that one is still zero. There's still zero crossings. And then you get anywhere up here, then there's always one from now on. One <coughs> crossing. And zero down here. So do you observe that the exponential function always has zero or one crossings for a horizontal line? As a result, the exponential function is called one-to-one -one or injective. Furthermore, that means that you can do a nice thing to it. You can draw the line y is x you 
We'll draw the line y is x. And now what we're going to do is we're going to take it and make a symmetric drawing. We're going to take the red and we're going to reflect it over y is x. We're going to do this kind of thing. Whoop. So notably, what, what, are, what are the coordinates of this point right here? Zero, one. Every exponential must go through that point. When you, when you reflect it across y is x, where does the blue point go? One, zero. So it's at zero, one, then it goes to one, zero. And in fact, the, you, you observe that these points transpo transpose 0, 1 goes to 1, 0. If we had a point right here, A, B, it would reflect to B, A. Okay, now if you, if you perform the reflection, the complete reflection, the result will look like this. So it's got to be symmetric. Mm -hmm. So just like this, this leg, if you like, goes off and trails that one, you're going to have another one that trails this way. So it's going to look like this. In this way, symmetric, and then it's going to do this, going this way. And what I want you to see is that what I just drew in green, does it pass the horizontal line test? Yep, it passes the horizontal line test, but it also passes the vertical line test. Right, the vertical line test is to see whether or not something is a function. So is the green thing a function? Yep. Is it a one-to-one -one function? Yep. The green function is important, uh, important enough to have its own name. What's its name? Logarithm. This is the logarithm of x. The logarithm is obtained, the natural logarithm is obtained from the natural exponential by reflecting it. So the process of reflecting it literally is running the exponential in reverse. It's saying that, well, instead of putting things on the input side and letting, letting outputs be produced, I'm going to run the machine in reverse. Okay. So the question is, remember, this is what I was asking before I got on this tangent way over here. What is the limit as x goes to infinity of the natural log of x? Which is to say, I suppose, just how high does the green function go? So it already, it, it gets past e. How high does it go up? Infinite. The question of how far, how far up does the green function go is equivalent to asking to how far right does the red function go. How far to the right does the red function go? It goes all the way to the right. That means that the green function goes all the way up. Now, the red function goes up very fast. Very, very fast. So here we are at input 0 for the red function. Its output is 1. If you were over here at 10, input 10, its output would already be in the thousands. If you went over to input uh, 100, okay, the output is starting to be close to the number of atoms in the universe. Not even the number of atoms, the number of protons. Okay, if you get much further, the numbers start to become so incredibly big that, that it's hard to conceive of why you would even think about them in a normal context. So as fast as the red function goes up, which is fast, that's how fast the green function goes slowly. So I'm, I'm pr presently facing east. So I, I, I happen to be facing east. If, if this exponential was complete, and if I was to come over here to say like, like about where my red pin is right here, I would be, and we were to draw it, this would be several miles away, up, east. If I was to go much further, I'd already be in the Atlantic Ocean. Fast. It's going up fast. Alternatively, suppose that for the logarithm, the green, 
that I wanted to ask myself, well, how long would it take before the green gets above that line? How far to the right would I have to go? Really far. Really, really far. And if I wanted to get the green to be above this, I'm facing east, so that way is south. Right? You'd have to be almost in Mexico to get, it, to get the green to be above that. To be above that one. It's going up very slow. But nevertheless, it makes it all the way. So any question about these things? These are limits that you already knew from Calculus 1. Okay, one last thing we have to do before I can describe to you just, just what it means for an integral to be improper. So this is now boundedness. So a shape is said to be bounded and so Im implicitly when I say a shape I mean a shape in the plane something I can draw on the sheet of paper A shape in the plane is said to be bounded if a circle of finite radius can be drawn around it. Okay, so almost any shape that you could possibly name has this property. <laughs> so can someone tell me the name of a bounded shape? How about a rectangle? So here's a nice, nice rectangle here. Is that a bounded shape? Yeah. Why is it bounded? That's not why. It's because of this. Can you draw a circle of finite radius around that rectangle? Yeah. How about this one? I drew a circle around it. So that rectangle is bounded. Okay. Okay, so I think you can probably agree that a triangle is bounded too, right? I could probably fit another triangle in there. Uh, and so is this shape. So there's some shape there. And it's not a named shape, not like a rectangle or something like that. It's not common enough in the experience to have a name. But nevertheless, I think we can agree that it's bounded. Okay. So now I hope that your interest is slightly piqued. What would an unbounded shape look like? <laughs> So I want you to consider the uh, region in the plane between x is 2 and x is uh, 6. So what would that look like? <laughs> I 
Well, so in the first place, it's a subset of the plane, right? So what does XS2 look like? A vertical line, right? Here it, here it too. Okay, and then what does X is six look like? <laughs> right, <laughs> and, it's, and it's about right here-ish. So what's the shape that we're talking about? It's not, it's not a rectangle, not at least in any classical sense. Well, I'm talking about the stuff that's between two and six. <coughs> So that's all of this, isn't it? Now I'm just drawing part of it because, well, that's all I can draw. But understand that that goes all the way up and that goes all the way down. Right? Is that a bounded shape? It's not. Hmm. It's not a bounded shape. You couldn't draw a circle, a finite radius around this. No matter what radius you selected, eventually that would just go on all the way. So this, is, this shape is unbounded. Now I have a question for you. Suppose that this was one of the planks in a really epic fence. How much paint would it take to, to paint it? An infinite amount of paint, right? No finite amount of paint would suffice. You couldn't paint it. Okay, so it's, this shape is unbounded. It has infinite area. Okay. Here's a, here's a nice thing I want you to think about. What is, you can, it, I think it's an okay thing to imagine that this is, a, this is like, like an infinitely tall rectangle. Okay, what's the width of the rectangle? Four. So suppose that I make it half as wide now. It's currently width four. And then I make it half as wide so it's width two now. So now will it take half as much paint? Why not? Because it's still infinite, right? It's still infinite. This is still infinite amount of paint. Okay, well, the door swings both ways. What if it's currently width 4? Suppose I make it width 400. Would it take any more paint? No. <laughs> the amount of paint is the same. Okay, that's a little disturbing. <coughs> now let's finally consider. Let's consider, could we possibly come up with a shape that's unbounded? That is to say, you can't draw a circle around it. But you could paint it with a finite amount of paint. Hmm. Is it possible to make a shape that you couldn't possibly draw a circle around it, but you could paint it? So now I want you to consider the region above y is 0, below y is 1 over x squared, and to the right of x is 1. Let's draw this. What does this look like? Sorry? It's very similar to one. So consider the region described like so. So in the first place, what does this look like? If just ignoring everything else, what does y is 1 over x squared look like? 
when you when you draw it in its entirety. At least to me, my, my subjective ex experience of it is it kind of looks like a volcano. Okay, and if you're not sure what 1 over x squared looks like, then I'm telling you that it is in your interest to get your college algebra textbook and find the section that's talking about the way plots look, and you need to memorize those. Because I'm working as if, on the homeworks and quizzes and things like that, I'm working as if you have all those memorized. I have been and will continue working under that assumption. So that's what 1 over x squared looks like. So now the question is, is well, what, what does this whole ensemble look like? Oh, well, it's going to look like... <coughs> So there's, so where is, where is y is 0? So this is x is 1. Where's y is 0? Mm -hmm. It's this, y is 0. So we want something that's above the x-axis, to the right of that, and under y is x squared. Well, y is x squared looks like this. So what we're talking about is we're talking about this region. So do you observe that this pointy thing goes all the way to the right? It never stops. <coughs> so it goes all the way. Could you draw a circle around this shape? You could not. No, no circle of finite radius. So this is an unbounded shape. You can't draw a circle around it. But my claim to you is, is that, in fact, this has a finite, a finite area. a finite amount of area in it. So does anyone care to hazard guess? How much area does it, does it have? I mean, if this has an infinite amount of area, how much does this one have? What do you think? Is it like over 100? over a million? I mean, because it, it goes all the way, right? All the way. Never stops. Is it wherever x is uh, X is zero is right here, I'm, so I don't understand your question. So what I, all I'm saying is that this shape squeezes down and, and never stops. It goes all the way to the right. It becomes very, very pointy, continues forever. Right, but the red never hits y is zero all the way out, right? So even if you're out at a million, one over a million squared is a small number, but it's positive. Is it one? It's one. That's how much area is in here. Let's show that's the case. Okay. Now, we're in a bit of a hard spot. So let's consider Let's consider the region, <clears throat> find the area above y is 0, below y is 1 over x squared, and to the right of 
x is 1. So this is the same, this, 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 that's exactly what we said on the previous page. So now here's the problem, is that we'd like to use an integral, right? <coughs> if we're finding areas, we'd like to use an integral. But now I need you to think back, even before, even before the fundamental theorem. When we were talking about integral, when we were taking shapes and cutting them into rectangles. Do you remember that? The way that we did it is we said, okay, let's take this shape and let's cut it into some finite number of rectangles. Like maybe 8 or 80. And then we made an approximation. But notably, when, when the way we were doing that is we were taking the interval of integration, A to B, and cutting that interval into finitely many pieces, all of which have finite size. So if we were to integrate, if we were to integrate for this scenario, what is the interval of integration? What would be the interval that we'd have to integrate over? One to infinity. So to use the integral, the interval would be 1 to infinity. This is not allowed. It's not allowed. All of our integral procedures, all of them, require that the interval is finite. So we could integrate from 1 to 5, That'd be fine. We could integrate from 1 to 5 million. That would be fine. You cannot integrate from 1 to infinity. That is not fine. So that means that nothing that we've learned about integration applies to this situation yet. That means we can't use the fundamental theorem. That means we can't even, do, we can't even start to cut it into rectangles. We can't even do that. So, do you observe that the fact that this interval is infinite is a really big problem? Okay, so this, the fact that we're doing that, that, that that's what we want to do, that, that make, that's an, uh, a party foul, right? You can't do it. So the fact that that interval is infinite, interval is infinite in length, Therefore, this integral is improper. So that's what is meant by this. To, to be precise, it's one of the meanings of improper, because integrals can be improper in other ways. So this, the interval we want to integrate over is infinite. That's not permissible. This integral is improper. So in order to use the machinery that we know and love, we now have to separate two steps. We have to do two different things. So to fix this, to overcome, we have to perform two separate steps. First step, we're going to truncate the interval 1 to infinity to the finite interval one to b. for some b that's more than 1, but finite. So can we integrate over the interval 1 to b? 
Yeah, because it's a finite interval. So specifically what we're doing is we're taking that shape, this shape, and it's like right here we're going to cut it at B and, leave all, and, and forget all the rest of the stuff that's to the right of that cut. Specifically, it's going to look like this. So there's one, and all that we know about B is we said that it's something more than one. So here's B. Okay, then 1 over x squared just on this interval, just on this one, looks something like this. And now, what I'd like for you to observe, this truncated shape, Is that shape bounded? Can you draw a circle around it? You can. So this is bounded. Because that's a bounded shape, therefore we can use the integral. So we truncate to a finite interval and integrate. So, what is the integral that tells us this area? So, what will the limits be? 1 to b. And then we're going to integrate 1 over x squared dx. Okay, that'll tell us the area that we have right there. So, for the purpose of algebra, 1 over x squared is nice, but we're not doing algebra, we're doing calculus. What would be a better way to write 1 over x squared? x to negative 2. So this would be um, integral 1 to b of x to negative 2. And that's terrific because that means we can use the fundamental theorem because we know an antiderivative of x to negative 2. What's the antiderivative of x to negative 2? x to negative 1, and then divided by negative 1, right? So x to negative 1 divided by negative 1, and then evaluated from 1 to b. OK, any question getting to there? OK, so now. This negative, I'm going to get rid of this negative by switching the order of the limits. So that'd be x to negative 1, and now I'm going to evaluate from b to 1. So I got rid of that by flipping the order. And now for algebra, what's a, what's a nicer way to write x to negative 1 for the purposes of algebra? 1 over x. So this is equal to 1 over x from b to 1. And then what is, what is this when you finally evaluate it now? So what do you get when you plug in 1? You, well, when you, when you plug in 1, you get 1, right? Because it's 1 over 1. And what do you get when you plug in b? 1 over b. Okay. Now, I have a question from 15 minutes ago. Here I wrote an x and, and dx. The, x is here, dx is there. Supposing I change these x's to w's, would that change the answer? No. What if I change them to v's? No, right? It won't change the answer. But do you observe that that the integral does in fact depend on the limits. Yeah, it does. <coughs> what does this what does this signify? What is this in terms of this exercise 1 minus 1 over b? What is it? 
In particular, what does it have to do with my drawing? The area, right? 1 minus 1 over b, that's how much area is in there. So this is this expression right here. That is the area of that shape. So what I'm telling you is suppose for the moment that this diagram is mobile so that I could move this B fence post around, right? Less area, more area. I could move it around. Supposing I place it right here and that B is 10, so, I, so that we're integrating from 1 to 10. How much area is in there? If B is 10. Not 9. 9 over, 10. 9 over 10, right? Because it would be 1 minus 1 over 10. That's 9 over 10. Supposing that I take the B even further out to 100. How much area is in there? 99 over 100, right? And then well, I, could take it, I could take it anywhere, right? If I take it to a million, that means that it would be 999,999 over a million. That's how much would be in there. <coughs> so now, what the, the final thing that you must do is, is tell me, how can we use this answer to, answer, to, to finally answer the question. How can we use this position, this knowledge, to answer the question? What is it? A limit, right? Because in the end, the question was not what's the area of this bounded shape. That's not the question. The question is what's is the area of this unbounded shape? <clears throat> so we can get the area of this shape by taking this one and dragging the B all the way to the right. And the, the calculus conceptual device that does that is limit. So we're going to take that B and move it all the way to the right. <coughs> so that was the first step. We truncate and find, find, it, find an integral. The second step is now you compute the limit. L limit. Limit. <laughs> Where did I put my eraser? Oh. I hit it really well for myself. Limit. as b goes to infinity, well, the limit as b goes to infinity of 1 minus 1 over b. Well, what's the limit of uh, 1 over b as b goes to infinite? What's the limit of that term? So just, just this one by itself. What's the limit of 1 over b? It's 0, right? One over, 1 over infinitely large is 0. So it would be minus 0. I'm doing that one first because, surprisingly to me, most students have an easier time with this one. What's the limit of 1 as b goes to infinity? 1, right? What does 1 do when b is going uh, to 12? It's still 1. What about when b is going to the grocery store? Still one, right? So the answer is one. So what? So we've come to a numeric result one. What does that have to do with the question? What does that mean, one? 
the value of what, though? What does this one mean? Does this mean one giraffe, one apple, one, what, what does it mean? Of what? Okay, of uh, what? What are we measuring? One unit of area. It's saying that that shape, <coughs> what we've concluded, is that this shape this unbounded shape has area 1 So in the right units, you could say like, it takes one liter of paint to paint it. That's how much paint it would take, one liter. Any question about this? So this one, if B were at 10, then it would take 9 tenths of a liter to paint it. This, this one would take the full liter. Okay, any question about this, yes? Uh, what? This? I'm not sure what you mean backwards. On this, well, the reason is because this expression was negative. So this is negative and this one is negative, so in the end that's why. Other questions? Okay. <clears throat> Uh, fine. So now let's do one that's almost just like it. So now find the area above y is zero, below y is one over x, and to the right of x is 1. So now, if you glance at the instructions too quickly, it might look like I wrote the exact same exercise as before. But there is a difference. What is the difference? It's 1 over x, one over x squared. Right. It's 1 over x now, instead of 1 over x squared. But I have a question for you. What does 1 over x look like when you draw it? Not a v. More or less. It would look quite similar to the other one, except now it looks like this. Oh, that's terrible. But it looks, it looks something like that. My, my, my hand like cramped up there for a second when I was trying to draw. So it would look like that. So in the region in, in, the region in question anyway, in the top right, they look quite similar. Okay, now again, just as a reminder, mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're hesitating as to what these plots look like, you really need to review what they look like. Okay. The strategy is exactly the same, okay? If we were to attempt to integrate immediately, right now, what would be the, inter what would be the interval of integration? One to infinity. This is not permissible. You cannot integrate over an infinite interval. You can only integrate over a finite interval. So how will we overcome this problem? <coughs> Cut it, right? The same thing that we did before. We, we truncate the interval, and therefore the shape, at some finite point. Okay? So in the first place, we truncate. And we called the truncation point B last time. But just to make sure that you don't develop 
an unwarranted emotional attachment to B, I'm going to call it M. So again, from 1, and it was to infinity, but now we're saying, well, we're just going to go to M. And we're going to cut the rest of it off. So the shape would look like this. And quite honestly, at least up to my ability to draw, it looks more or less just like the previous shape. So how much area? So we're going to do the same thing before. We're going to integrate this, then we're going to pull this fence post all the way to the right. How much area is going to be in here? Remember, there was one unit of area on the previous exercise. So what's it going to be this time? So we have a vote for one. Do we have any other, any other suggestions? Not quite. Logarithm of zero is not defined. Well, so I, we got a vote for one. Let's see how that turns out. So we could compute the, er the area shown with an integral. What are the limits of integration? One to m. And what is it that is being integrated? 1 over x dx. Well, that's terrific, right? Because we can use the fundamental theorem. So we're going to truncate specifically at m. And to make sure that m is always to the right of 1, we're going to say that, well, I'm talking about some point to the right of 1. So what is the antiderivative of 1 over x dx? So what is it? Uh, we're getting there, but what is for now, what is the antiderivative of 1 over x dx? Log of x. Log of absolute value of x. And then we must evaluate from 1 to m. Now, because 1 is a positive number, and m is even more positive than 1, <laughs> if you like, that means that we can, in fact, drop the absolute value. So it would be log of x from 1 to m. So this would be log of m minus log of 1. Now, how much is the log of 1? Zero. Right? So then. So then the log of 1 is 0, so this is actually log of m. So I, I agree that eventually the integral is log of m, but what is the meaning of that, of this? What does that have to do with anything? What is that? What does it have to do with this exercise that we're solving? Log of m. Yeah, it's this area. That's how much area is in there. So this is the area of that. Which is to say, if we were to take this m and pull it over to 100, how much area would be contained? Log of 100, whatever that is. If we were to pull it over to a million, the area contained would be log of a million, whatever that is. Okay. In fact, not in this class, but in in, in other calculus classes, like the engineering calculus class. In fact, this is the definition of the logarithm of n. That's how you actually define it. 
w because in those classes you're interested in, in just, just exactly how are things defined. Okay, so that's how much area is in there. Now, have we answered the <coughs> exercise? No, right? Because in the end, the question is, is well, what if, what if you pull this fence post all the way to the right so that it becomes over here and becomes an infinitely sharp thingy like on the previous exercise? So how do we finally address that? Yeah, now, now we compute a limit. So the limit as m goes to infinity of the natural log of m. And again, to make sure that you don't lose track of the concept, this is the way the math jargon, the calculus jargon of saying, well, I want you to take this and I want you to pull it to the right. How far to the right? All the way to the right. That's what you're, we're saying. So what is the limit as <coughs> m goes to infinity of the log of m? So what is it? It's infinite. It's infinite. Now wait a second. What does that mean? <laughs> yeah, how much paint would it take? All the paint, right? In fact, all the paint wouldn't even come close to sufficing. What it's saying, what it's saying, is that this shape right here from 1 to infinity where this is 1 over x not 1 over x squared but 1 over x how much area is in here? all, <laughs> all of it, right? an infinite amount of area is in there I'd like for you to understand that this is striking to me. It's always striking when I think about it. The two shapes look almost the same. And they basically are the same as, as well it, up to my ability to draw them anyway because I'm not so, so skilled. <laughs> the one of them has area one and this one has infinite amount of area. No amount of paint would suffice to paint it. So I hope you get the impression that things are getting weird. It's about to get weirder. Because now I want you to make a different consideration. I want you to, in the first place, I want you to draw the region R, which is above y is 0, below y is 1 over x, and between x is 1 and x is, let's use some other letter now. So we've used b and m. What else would be good? W, W is the first one I heard, where W uh, is more than one. So I want you to draw that region. So now that hopefully you've diligently drawn it, I hope you realize it's exactly the same region that's on the previous exercise, except instead of naming it M, the right fence post M, what did we name the right fence post? W. But otherwise, it's exactly the same. So this is R. R looks like this. Uh, 
one W. Okay, terrific. Now, to I want you to draw the solid S obtained by revolving R about the x-axis. Which is to say, here's the region R. And what I'm requesting of you is for you to rotate it, revolve it around the x-axis. Okay, well, <clears throat> the profile on the top would look something like this. The profile on the bottom, something like this. But remember, it's sweeping out a whole volume. So supposing we could see the larger side, but not the smaller side, my artist's impression of what it might look like is that. So we'd be able to see that one and that one, but not that one wouldn't be able to see that. So it's like a, it's a solid object. If it was just the shell, if it was just the surface, it would be like a, uh, like a megaphone. You know, when you go to a sporting event and someone's yelling through the thing, it would be like that, one of those things. Okay, so any question about this? Okay, three. I want you to tell me the volume of S, that shape you just drew. Of course, we talked about the, sol the volume of, the sol of a solid of revolution. And of course, I hope dearly that you realize that this is exactly one of the homework exercises that you just turned in. Okay, so then just like so many things in this section, the formula to, to do this is an integral, right? So what's the integral? What are the limits? 1 to w. And then what? What, do, what must we integrate? Right, pi times the radius squared. Well, what's the radius? 1 over x, so pi times 1 over x squared dx. So that's the formula. Any question about coming to the formula? OK, well, let's compute it. First off, the pi is a multiplier, so it can come out. So this is pi integral 1 to w. And then I'll distribute the square so that we get 1 over x squared. Now I have a question for you. I'm, we're going to continue, but, but by the time we get to the end of this integral, does, will the answer depend on x? No, but it, but it will depend on what? W. 
It's going to depend on w because w is a limit, but it's not going to depend on x. So this would be pi, uh, and then I'll change it from 1 over x squared to x to negative 2. And then, oh, hooray, we can use the fundamental theorem. And we get pi times x to negative 1 divided by negative 1, and then from 1 to w. And this is now, I hope, feeling very similar to the exercise that we did half an hour ago. So this would be what? Uh, pi <coughs> times 1 over w. So that's chain, uh, sorry. Oh, where did I put my eraser? Oh, there it is. So it would be pi times 1 over x, and then evaluated from w to 1, where I did two steps at the same time. I switched the order of evaluation by spinning that negative, and then I wrote x to negative 1 as 1 over x. Then finally, this will be pi multiplied by 1 minus 1 over w. What is the meaning of that? What does this thing mean? Volume of what? Of that, right? So this, this thing, <coughs> is the volume of that. Okay, so if W, here's 1 and here's W, supposing W were at 4, supposing it were at 4, then that would be 1 minus 1 fourth. So that's 3 fourths. So if W were at 4, this thing would have volume pi times 3 fourths. That would be its volume. Okay? And if we were to move it over W to 10, its volume would be pi times 9 tenths. And if we were to move it to w to 100, it would be pi times 99 over 100. Now, here's the last thing I want you to do on this exercise. What about the infinite shape, the infinite volume that we could obtain by taking this w and pulling it all the way and watching this be pulled all the way so that this comes to, a, to an infinitely fine point. This would be like a pointy, uh, 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 a very pointy tent if we were to set it like this, right? It's coming up and becoming very, very pointy at the top, infinitely pointy. It goes infinitely far that way. So this shape, this is not a two-dimensional shape. This is a three-dimensional solid. It's a volume. But notice that this one right here, where we've truncated it at w, you could in principle put this inside of a sphere. So this is a bounded volume, okay? because you could put it inside of a sphere. So for every one of us, each individual is a bounded volume, because in principle, you could be put inside of a sphere. The Earth almost is a sphere, and you could put it in a slightly larger sphere, so the Earth is in fact bounded. This is a bounded shape. So what I'm talking about is imagine the, imagine the, the three-dimensional shape that's obtained by taking this and dragging it all the way out. How much volume would it have? Mm-hmm. So now let w go to infinity. So the limit as w goes to infinity of pi multiplied by 1 minus 1 over w, well, the pi goes to pi, the 1 goes to 1, and 1 over w goes to what? 0, right? So the answer is pi. As a result, what that is telling you, 
What that's telling you is that this shape this three-dimensional shape, which is infinite in extent, what's its volume? Has volume pi. <coughs> now, Something is amiss. Not really. There's not really something amiss. But I want to point something out. And I want someone to say the obvious. We have, so far, done three things. We've done three exercises. But we've done a, we've, but we've done a multitude of things. So, in the first place, if we take this shape right here, and this is, I'm going to do it in blue. If this is y is 1 over x squared, then how much area is in here? 1. Right? Even though it goes infinitely far to the right. So this has area is 1. OK? Then, the very next one that we did was, well, suppose we do almost the same looking kind of thing. And this is 1. And now, instead of doing 1 over x squared, what if we make it 1 over x? What if we make it 1 over x? And how much area is in here? Infinite. So in particular, no amount of paint would suffice to paint this one. No, no, there's no way you could paint it with a finite amount of paint. And then we considered this shape. where this is y is 1 over x, and we've revolved it around the axis. And on the very previous page, we established what's the volume of this object. This has volume pi. So I'd like to point out what that means. That means that if this were just a shell, and if we were to hold it like this, then we could take a little more than 3.14 liters of paint and fill it up. We could fill it with a, with a little more than 3.14 liters of paint. That's what that means. But this is really and truly a problem. 
or at least seemingly. Because have a look at this shape. How much paint would it take to paint this? An infinite amount. And how much paint would it take to fill this? 3.14, a little bit more than 3.14 liters. But this shape actually fits inside of this, right? Because that's how we got this, is we took this one and revolved it around. That's how we got it. So what I'm telling you is that this shape is actually right there. I mean, that's exactly it. That could be like a little baffle that's inside of the cone, just a little bitty edge that's in there. So what's not OK about this? What, what seems weird about this? <laughs> well, on the one hand, no amount of paint would suffice to paint this. If you were to get out a paintbrush and try and paint it, no amount of paint would suffice. On the other hand, if you just put it inside of this thing and then poured 3.14 liters or so into it, then you'd fill the whole thing up. And it, this thing would, I guess, be covered with paint. Mm, this is disturbing. <laughs> So can you see that there's something here that doesn't feel quite right? On the one hand, you couldn't paint this, but you could put it inside of this and then fill this full of paint. Now, the point of me bringing you here <laughs> to this, to this, to this uh, confusing place is to point something out, okay? And here, here's the long and the short of it. Human beings, as computational devices, meat computers that we are, are excellent, excellent at considering shapes and considering a variety of other things. Like, for example, for, for typical adults, <clears throat> any one of you, I suspect that I could take you know, a crumpled up sheet of paper and if you're looking and, and you're ready, I could toss it at you and you could catch it. No problem. That's, a, that's an interesting calculus problem. There's all kinds of things going on there. Physics, mechanics, trajectories, you know, friction due to the air, all kinds of things. But you could do it. And you could reckon things about the shapes, about shapes. And I hope that you're really surprised that your intuition is completely broken by this. The reason why it is happening in the end is because all of our experience, all of your experience, your biographical experience, your life, that is to say, from birth to now, and all of the experience of all of your ancestors has never included an infinite amount of things or a, or a thing that has an infinite amount of size. It, w it never came to us a time where we really needed to consider if there were infinitely many lions chasing us. <coughs> It never happened. That was not a thing. We did not need to consider a scenario where there were infinitely many apples. Or we were infinitely far away from a pear. Or whatever. We never needed to consider that. That never came up. As a result, you human beings, and, and all of you in particular, do not have a good intuition about infinite things. And if you want to get a good intuition about what happens when there's infinite things, like a, like a shape of infinite size, then you'll have to become a mathematician, or at least study some math, because that's the only place where you'll be able to get intuition about it. Here is a shape that can't be painted, yet it can easily be put inside of an object that can be filled with paint. And there's nothing at all contradictory about that statement. The thing that, if you're, if it's still, if you're still recoiling inside, that's because you have a long history of, of being able to reckon shapes, but all of that history is about finite shapes, bounded shapes. So now, to really drive this point home, 
I want you to consider a thought experiment. This is a thought experiment. Um, it's a really good thought experiment, and I didn't come up with it. It's far predates me. The thought experiment is called Hilbert's Hotel. So I want you to imagine the first case, which is the finite case. So we have a hotel, and this hotel has exactly four rooms. And the hotel follows the following rules. There is one person allowed to be in each room, that at most. That is to say, each room is either not occupied or occupied by a single individual. And furthermore, there's no discrimination whatsoever. If you show up and ask for a room, and there is a room available, then it will be given to you. Okay? So suppose that the present state of the hotel is that there are three red people in it. Three of the four rooms are occupied. Suppose a green person shows up. And the green person asks, can I have a room? Then what's the answer? Yeah. Yes. The answer is yes. You can go to the first room. OK, so far so good. Now suppose that the blue person shows up. And the blue person asks, well, can I have a room? What's the answer? The answer is no, you cannot. Okay, so there's nothing at all surprising about this. I could walk a, uh, I could walk a, a young child through this, no problem. So now let's consider a different case. <coughs> Let's consider an infinite number of rooms. So the situation is going to be almost exactly the same, except now, because in the way it's going to be almost exactly the same is all but one room is going to be full. So suppose the second room, and the third room, and the fourth room, and all subsequent rooms are full with red people. And suppose that a green person shows up. And the green person asks, can I have a room? And what's the answer? Yeah. You can go to the first room. So far, so good. Now suppose that the blue person shows up, and the blue person asks, can I have a room? What's the answer? The answer is yes. There's room. There's plenty of room. There's more room than you could possibly imagine. <coughs> so since I'm, the, since I'm telling the story, I'll be the manager of the hotel. All that I'll do is I'll get on the loudspeaker, well, the telephone, and make an announcement and say, OK, everyone, um, there's been a change of plans. I need you to take your room number, and I need you to add one, and that's your new room number. So where will the, where will the person in room 8 go to room 9? And where will the person in room 1,325 go. OK, so does everyone see the way it will go? So what I'm saying is that the new configuration, <coughs> after everybody's followed the instructions, is that, well, the green person now was in room one, but now they're in room two. 
And this one has moved over uh, to this room. And this one has moved to that room. And this one has moved to that room. And all the people afterward also moved, uh, moved down. So where can the blue person go? Room one. Okay, that's okay. That's cute. But what what if what if instead of one blue person showing up, what if uh, ten blue people showed up? Would there still be room? How? Right. I could just make the, make almost the same announcement. I could make that announcement ten times, or I could just say, okay. Take your room number and add 10. That's your new room. OK. So that's a little disturbing. Why would, that, why would the same trick not work here? Right, because if these, if these people were to shift to the right, one of them would fall off the edge, right? But there is no edge to fall off of in the infinite case. So even, even young children can understand this case because part of our heritage, our shared heritage uh, as human beings is we, we know something and it has, as I understand it, in, in math it's called the box principle and I think it's also called the box principle in psychology. Even young children understand the box principle because if you have five things if you have five things and all the things must be in a box and you only have four boxes, then there's at least one box that has two things in it. There's, there's no way to get around that. So now here's the, here's the real kicker. So, okay, you kind of, I, I think you see the trick now. Okay, I can shift them down. What if instead of one blue person showing up and instead of ten blue people showing up, what if infinitely many blue people show up? Well, I have to be able to tell everyone their new room. So like when 10 blue people showed up, I could say, take your room number, add 10, and that's your new room. So like the person in room 60 would go to room 70. So I can't get on the phone and say, Take your room number, add infinity, and that's your new no room number, because that's that's not a number. But the problem of doing that is that then, for example, where would the green person be at the end of this process? So the question in the end that you have to address is that where would each of these people go? I see what you're saying. Just get on the phone and, and do the procedure infinitely many times. But then where would the green person be? Yeah, so then that doesn't, so it doesn't work. So, so if infinitely many blue people show up, can, can, can we make room? And can we say where the green person is supposed to go? And where this third red person is supposed to go? Can we do it? And the answer is? Yes. Yes, we can. Because I'll just get on the phone and I'll say, everyone, there's been a change of plans. I want you to take your room number. So go have a look at it on the door. Find your room number. I want you to multiply that by two, and that's your new room number. So the, people in the person in room five would now be in room what? Ten. The green person who's currently in room two would then be in room Four. The person who's in room 100 would, be in the, would now be in the room 200. So everybody knows exactly where they're going. But what's the virtue of having made that decision? Right, the, the neat thing about this decision is that when everybody moved down, the first room was open. When everybody doubles their room number, what rooms are open? The odd ones. Room one is open, room three is open, room five is open, room seven is open. How many odd numbers are there? Infinitely many. 
So that means that we would just spread out all these, all of these, this, this green person and all these red people. Y'all just spread out a little bit, and then all the blue people are going to come in every other room. Incredible. <laughs> so, so the the joke is that when they built Hilbert's Hotel, okay. You, if you've ever been to a hotel, like on a road trip, you know they have they've got that sign that says vacancy, and they can light up the no, so it says no vacancy. You know, you know what I'm saying? So they didn't they didn't install the no on Hilbert's hotel. It just says vacancy, right? It's never full. The reason why this works is because there's not finitely there because there's infinitely many rooms. If this is surprising, so I hope that you understand that. This might be surprising to you because you're seeing it for the first time. But do understand that that surprise has nothing to do with the fact that this is wrong or weird and everything to do with the fact that you're a human being and your, your training has to do with finitely many things. Okay, so the last, the last deal. We can introduce the next topic. So now we're in chapter 9. which is multivariable calculus. So, until about 30 seconds ago, we were studying functions whose signature is R to R. What does that mean? Right, that the input, the, the input thing is a real, and the output thing is a real. You plug in a number, out comes a number. So when you draw the reals by themselves, when you just draw a copy of the reals, what does it look like when you draw it? You, kn you know the answer, you just don't understand the way I'm asking it. A line. So when you draw the reals, it's a straight line. And you single out a point as being particularly, particularly important, the origin. Okay. Now, notably, this is a one-dimensional object because you can only travel in one direction. Okay, so this is one-dimensional. Now, when we plot functions with signature reals to reals, we plot them on the plane, but do understand what that means. That means that for something like this, it's saying that this is the input. This is the copy of the reals that signifies the input. And this is the copy of the reals that signifies the output. So here's a particular real input. What this drawing is saying is that this real input corresponds to this real output. This input, that output. So now, part of calculus, the part that we just finished, calculus one, the part that we just finished talking about is, well, about this shape, we could consider areas over and under and things like that. And in the end, the name for that discussion is integral. A, sec a, a different bit of the discussion is that what if you were here on this function, on this red, and you were very, 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 very small, very small. Then this red is smooth enough that it would appear flat. I don't mean horizontal. I mean it would be, it would be a straight thing without bending. And just according to my eye, it would look like this. So that's the best flat approximation of the red at that point. That's an extremely important concept. What's the name of that concept? Tangent, line, right? So to understand what we're going to do next time is now the signature of the function is going to be like this. Is 
What does that mean? Mm -hmm. That's saying that the input is going to be a point on the plane and the output is going to be a point on a line. So we're going to have a two-dimensional input producing a one-dimensional output. As a result, we're going to have to start drawing three-dimensional things. So for example, this is one axis parallel to the page, parallel to the page, this one's coming out of the page. So we could have a little, say, sombrero looking thing here. It's supposed to be a, a surface, like you could wax it, okay? You could, you could uh, you know, make it really smooth. Not like, not like this thing that has a sharp edge here. It's very smooth. The, one of the very first things we're going to consider is that if this is a very smooth object and you're at that point, that red point, and if you're very, very, very small, just like you were very small on this, then how would this object appear to you? It would appear flat, just like this one appears flat. But being on this object and being very small, it wouldn't appear like a line. How would it appear? It would appear like a plane, flat, like this. So we're going to have to figure out, OK, well, how do we compute the tangent flat here? So if you go on in math, eventually they'll be called tangent flats, because you don't worry about calling them their, their name that corresponds to their dimension. This is a tangent line. This is a tangent plane. They're all called tangent flats. And that's what we'll talk about next time. So have a nice weekend.